And so welcome everyone to uh, this webinar series. It's the, the first in our new neurotechnology webinar series. Um, and we're going to be covering bioelectronic medicines today. Um, so my name is Charlie Winkler-Smith and I lead the Neurotechnology Special Interest Group uh, at the KTN. Um, so just uh, we'll go over the webinar protocol uh, just before we get started. Um, because of the uh, large number of uh, people registered today, um, all the participants will be muted. Um, but if you do have any technical problems, then please use the uh, chat box. And my colleague Poonam should be able to help you out. If you have any questions for the speakers, then please use the Q&A box um, and there'll be plenty of time between uh, each presentation uh, for us to ask those questions. Um, and just to note, the webinar is being recorded, uh, so you'll be sent a link um, after, after this, um, along with the presentations as well. So I'll just run through the agenda very quickly. So I'm going to give a, a very quick introduction to uh, the Neurotechnology Special Interest Group. Uh, we'll then hear from Tim Dennison from the University of Oxford, who will be giving us an historical perspective on bioelectronic medicines. We'll then hear from Aaron Shridhar from Galvani Bioelectronics, um, who'll be giving us more of a, a commercial outlook. And then we'll hear from Tim Constantinou um, from Imperial, who'll be telling us the latest advances in bioelectronic medicines. And then we'll have a, a quick panel discussion. Um, and as I mentioned, there'll be plenty of time for questions um, after each talk. So just to give you a bit of background, uh, the KTN's Neurotechnology Special Interest Group was set up um, about a year ago with the aim of bringing together and growing the neurotechnology community in the UK. We want to really help to accelerate the commercialization of new uh, neurotechnologies. Obviously with uh, COVID-19 now, it's perhaps harder than it was before to, to meet new partners, uh, new collaborators. Um, so please do get in touch with the KTN. We're here to help. Um, hopefully we can make some useful connections uh, for you, perhaps give you some advice on, on funding. So please do uh, get in contact. Um, earlier this year, we also ran um, a series of biodesign workshops where we were looking at the impact of neurotechnology on different uh, disease states. So we looked at uh, neuropathic pain, mood and psychotic disorders, and stroke rehabilitation. Um, so we now have reports on all of these, which you can find um, online. So if you go to the, the link at the bottom of the screen, uh, you'll be able to download these reports. And as I mentioned, this is the first it, uh, webinar in, in our new series. Um, so on the 16th of July, we'll, we'll be looking at brain computer interfaces. And I'm delighted that we have Damien Coyle, who'll be uh, demoing his new Flex EEG device. And then on the 16th of September, uh, we'll be doing a Neurotechnology for Dementia webinar. Um, some of you may have been registered for the live event, which was going to be on the 16th of September. Um, we've made the decision to, to move that online. So um, if you haven't registered for, for either of those, then uh, just follow the, the links on the screen. Okay, so we thought it would be very useful um, to find out uh, who was listening in today. Um, so, Poonam, can you bring up the Menti survey? Brilliant. So, if you can all go to your phones and type in menti.com, uh, which you can see at the, the top of the screen, and then use the code 556524, um, then we can move on to the next question. Okay, so using that code, um, can you tell us what type of organization you are from? So industry, academia, research, technology organization, government, medical investor, or other. And just whilst we're waiting for the results to come in, I'll um, introduce our first speaker, Tim, Tim Dennison. Um, Tim is, a professor at Oxford, but he also is the chair of the Neurotechnology Special Interest Group. Um, so he was absolutely instrumental in, in getting this group set up. Um, so welcome, Tim. Thank you, Charlie. So one thing I'm, uh, oh, we just had the Minty code is at the top of your screen, 556524. 
Um, so Charlie, you know, as we get the questions coming in, what have been your biggest takeaways so far from the first three meetings? I suppose one thing that, that came up was perhaps regulation, that it can be a little difficult in the UK when compared to uh, perhaps the US. Um, so that's definitely been a takeaway. But I suppose for me, the, the most exciting thing is the, the amount of enthusiasm there is in the sector for neurotechnology. We've, we've got an incredibly strong research base, but, but that's now being translated in, into industry. Um, so it's, it's a really, really um, exciting space. Yeah. Excellent. Well, so, looks like we've got a good uh, number of uh, feedback coming in. So, uh, yeah. Should we move on to the next question, Bruno? Brilliant. So, what is your level of knowledge of bioelectronic med medicine? So, are you a specialist? Are you aware, or are you uh, is, are you completely new to bioelectronic medicines? Quite quite an even split. Hopefully this will, will help the speakers just pick, pitch the, uh, their talk slightly. Yeah, we appreciate you giving us this insight into the audience. Of course, the, uh, with this kind of split, we apologize to those we might leave behind sometimes, and we apologize to the others who we might be boring, but you know, try as much as we can to uh, you know, have everyone walk away with something from this, uh, from this ex exchange. Great. So I think we're, we're stable now. So I think everyone's contributed. Um, so thank you. Thank you everyone for that. And then, uh, Tim, do you want to share your screen and we can share sure. your talk? Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Are you all set for me to go ahead? Yeah, that's good. Charlie, yeah, so thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, again, I'm Tim Dennison at the University of Oxford. And my role among the three of us is to give a little bit of a high level introduction, especially some of the history, the challenges, of course, that this is very rich history. And so some things will be left out. I will say our emphasis for today's um, exchange is primarily electronic interventions that are invasive. And so we'll be doing some non-invasive technologies, wearables and the like at upcoming um, webinars. So very quickly, I'm showing you my disclosures. I am gonna show um, some examples from companies that I consult with, and also very importantly, some of the devices are investigational use only, uh, particularly the Activa PC Plus S and uh, Summit and the Synchron. One thing to ground us all as we deal with COVID is that neurological diseases are also a very significant socioeconomic burden. And if you look at the numbers, this is a summary that came out uh, looking at the EU. You can see that the numbers impacted are actually in the tens of millions. This is the top row uh, for each condition. The cost per subject is then allocated in the middle row to show the economic um, burden that those disorders create per patient. And then the bottom is actually the aggregate cost. And so you can see that even in light of COVID, we still are facing significant issues and they will continue to be significant issues with neurological disorders. And so we're talking tens of millions of patients, hundreds of billions of euros per year spent. And so we're always as technologists think about ways we might be able to lower this economic burden. And this is just a snapshot um, within the central diseases of the central nervous system. And then Arun's gonna talk about some of the peripheral nervous system as well and the opportunities there. Part of the interest in exploring bioelectronics is to complement um, pharmaceutical development. So this is a summary paper from 2012 talking about the pharmaceutical productivity and how it's evolving over time. So if you note on the y axis, um, it's logarithmic. 
and it's trending downwards as time goes by linearly. So right around the turn of the millennium, it was about $1 billion in U.S. R&D spending in order to release a new drug. And so this is a very challenging uh, R&D efficiency curve and it continues to be an issue um, when we're looking at treating better treating disorders of the nervous system. You'll note that the slang for this term is called E-Room's Law, which E-Room is more spelled backwards. Um, and so this is, you know, is the, you know, kind of in counterpoint to, you know, the Gordon Moore's, in quote, law uh, for how integrated circuits have progressed over time. And this is a slide provided by IMEC in Belgium showing the evolution of what a circuit in 1971 would look like as it evolves. And eventually as we get towards the right hand side of the screen, you know, we just lose, lose out showing any progression because we're getting down to sub pixel levels on my uh, laptop. So we have to cut it off there. So the opportunity for us is to say, you know, from an electronics revolution standpoint, what, what opportunities does that scaling laws, the computational capabilities, sensing, energy scaling, what can we do to apply that to the treatment of medicine? Of course, these are very old uh, concepts. Uh, so starting in the 1780s the, with Galvani, Volta, there was the observation that there was quote animal electricity and that you could actually stimulate muscles, um, reanimate animals um, through electrical um, interventions. And that was you know, known to a certain extent, but really in the 1960s, the advent of the transistor and its propagation really started to open up new avenues of exploration. Um, in particular, what the transistor allowed us to do is provide very precise timing and control of currents and interface with the nervous system. And perhaps the most you know, ubiquitous example of that today that we are familiar with uh, is the cardiac pacemaker, which is an example of merging uh, biology, physiology, and electronics, of course, starting with the first battery-powered pacemaker with uh, Earl Bakken, then applying that to an implantable device um, over time. And then, as you can see, progressing you know, over decades, the addition of both sensor technology, adding intelligence in the device to make it responsive to patients' needs in real time, and then also um, becoming immune to the environment, such as the MRI, but most importantly, the scaling. And so it's similar to what we saw in Moore's Law, taking advantage of technology evolution and how that scaling can allow extreme miniaturization and most importantly, new workflows. So I'm gonna show a, a quick example um, provided by Medtronic for its micro pacing system. Your and, heart whoops. beats too slowly. First, we'll start with just the example of what a classical pacemaker would look like. So you have a slowly uh, beating heart, bradycardia, then you could go in and through the venous system, access through a lead uh, placed in the right ventricle and start to actually speed up the rate of the heart. So this would help with people with uh, slowly beating, you know, hearts that weren't beating sufficiently to give them an, enough cardiac output. But then you can see that's quite an invasive device, goes into a pocket in the chest. And with the advancement in energy density and electronics, you could start to look at scaling that down to the level of, say, a large vitamin. And most importantly is when you're looking at something that's down at that scale of size, it enables new ways to place the device within the body. And this is something that I really want to reinforce and kind of set the stage for the day is that it's ultra miniaturization, instead of going in surgically through the chest, now you can go in, say, in the model of a stent procedure and place the device into the right ventricle using a catheter. So that's kind of what's shown in this movie. The little tines at the end act as hooks that help to affix the device into the base, the apex of the right ventricle, and then through wireless programming, you can basically set the system up and have it beat on its own. So that's a example of how bioelectronics has evolved over the last several decades. And even last week, they announced um, a new device that uses accelerometry to help to better synchronize the heart. So another example of success is the cochlear implant which um, goes in as a prosthesis. And on the left-hand panel here, you can see 
how the hair cells in the inner ear might be compromised due to um, either a pharmaceutical side effect or some other uh, issue. And what engineers have been able to do is replace that transduction mechanism of the hair cell and through these uh, motion to nerve impulses with an electronic system where it mimics the frequency encoding of the cochlea with instead a bank of bandpass filters and through stimulation can basically replicate um, to first order, maybe zero up to first order, some of the functionality of the cochlea and provide meaningful speech replacement to patients. And so this is also a very successful example of physiology, biology, interplaying with electronics to restore function. And the final example I want to highlight is from the UK, kind of our, uh, our hometown example is Fine Tech Medical in uh, Welland Garden City, came out from an old MRC unit in neuroprosthesis with Brindley and Donaldson. And what this system does is place electrodes over the sacral roots and taps into the bladder function, so the bladder and the bowel. And then through an external programmer, it's kind of shown in uh, example A, the user of the system can go through different programs and that fires off different uh, motor codes and helps to restore some level of bladder bowel functionality. And also importantly, provide some benefits say with um, the amount of infections, the UTIs that patients might go through. So this is an example of, kind of quietly within the UK of an active implantable medical device that has also been around for several decades and has been implanted in several thousand patients. So to sum up kind of this high level introduction, I just want to bring together the key elements of what, you know, I think, you know, some of the key elements of bio a successful bioelectronic coming to the clinic. And on the right, these include the clinical necessity, the scientific validity, and the technical maturity, all things that as engineers um, we're quite comfortable with and understand, but also some of the other elements that I want to bring forward are the healthcare economics, thinking about the economic viability of the device, how viable the workflow is, and the regulatory pathways. So an example of the workflow viability, just to make it concrete for you, is that example of the cardiac pacemaker transitioning from a surgical procedure um, in the chest and instead transitioning into looking a lot like a stent placement. So we're always looking for opportunities here to be efficient on all elements of this uh, wheel. And I draw it as a wheel, because just like a wheel, if you pull out uh, one of these elements and you're not really optimized, it can be a bumpy road. And if you pull out two of them, you might just not be able to turn the wheel and have a successful system. So to set the stage for the next two speakers, we're gonna really start to talk about the rise of bioelectronic medicines, you know, this uh, biology, physiology, electronics coming together to solve um, and address disease states. So Arun's going to talk about applications, which are highlighted some on the left with some examples that are out in the clinic today, ranging from treating diseases of the central nervous system. Um, we talked about the cardiac pacemaker, getting into the periphery, say for incontinence, uh, foot drop. But just as importantly as thinking about the technology stack, which is shown on the right, and this is what Tim uh, Constantino is going to talk about the technology such as material interfaces, sensors, actuators, as well as importantly, the methods that we use to classify and perhaps control devices in the future. And Arun's gonna come and emphasize this in his talk as well, that notion of coming up with a dose and what does it mean to come up with a prescription when you have an electronic system. This will be very important as we move the discussion forward. So I'm gonna talk briefly about the technology stacks and how they've been applied in the past to set the, set the stage for the discussions for the last two talks. So first, you know, looking again at um, where we are today, this is an example movie of a gentleman with essential tremor. This is a tremor that elicits as he tries to control his motion. And he has a deep brain stimulator in place. And on the left, the stimulator is off, while on the right, the stimulator is on. And so as you can see, the stimulation is providing benefits, but there is still residual tremor. We don't have complete uh, reduction of his symptoms. And what this highlights is the challenge of symptom control and what we call the therapeutic window, sort of setting the stage for Aaron's talk about dosing of implants. 
And so one of the big challenges is how do we actually optimize care while avoiding side effects using electronics? And part of that is in terms of thinking about where those constraints come from is how did we get here? And that generation one brain interface system, DBS, consists of an electrode placed deep within a target of the brain placed by a stereotactic neurosurgeon. Electrodes are then routed up through the skull and then connect to an implantable pulse generator in the chest, very similar to that first generation of cardiac stimulator. So a lot of technology reuse obviously is applied here. But functionally, the intent here was to replace a surgical lesion. That was the origin of where deep brain stimulation came from, was replacing a surgical lesion. And, and from a certain perspective, that's anchored the field for several decades in terms of the mindset that's applied to dosing and control. But one of the trends we're seeing in the bioelectronic medicines is to shift this mindset from a, a replacement of a lesion perspective to more of a dynamic physiology-based co-processing, where there's a real emphasis on the creation of uh, more natural, physiologically relevant neural codes and how those are dynamically adjusted based on the, the real-time physiology that's measured from a patient. So as opposed to just having the passive actuator with a fixed tone, what are the kind of signals that we can apply and use that to close the loop and adjust the stimulator in real time? So that real emphasis on timing and neural communication in the device. So as one example of the state of the art, here is a um, device a prototype from the University of Florida using the Activa PC Plus S where Aisha Gundes, Kelly Foote and Mike Oaken were connecting cortical strips placed over the motor cortex and those are used to drive depth leads within the thalamus in real time. Oops, so let's play this movie. So this shows an example of the research subject. We start with the control state. So very similar to the first movie where as they go about their activities of daily living, their challenge say in terms of pouring a cup um, due to the intention tremor being elicited. And this makes it a challenge for them to um, to go about uh, you know, their daily activities. And so what Professor Gundes is exploring is can we optimize that device to get a, a, the benefit of tremor control, but when the tremor is not elicited, say turn the device down. So side effects such as dysarthria with speech or paresthesias are um, less prevalent. And so this, what's shown in this video in the top panel on the raw channel is that signal from the motor cortex. The intermediate panel is the power within specific bands of the brain that are associated with motion. And then the bottom panel of stimulation is the real time stimulation state of the device. And so you can see as the subject sets the glass down and rests, the stimulation ramps down, preserving both the battery and the device and hopefully avoiding uh, side effects that are that can be part of the therapy. When the therapy is needed, you can detect that from the motor cortex state and then ramp the stimulation up appropriately. And so this is an example of bioelectronics in the central nervous system taking on more of that dynamic physiological response. But then also moving outward, say into the spinal cord, there are similar opportunities. Um, this is an example from EPFL with Gregoire Cortine's team where they were going into the spinal cord of spinal cord injury subjects and modifying an existing spinal cord stimulator to provide a more dynamic pattern. So the intent here, and this is really important, is to modify existing technology as a first in human prototype that could elicit, say, the restoration of gait or other um, functionality. And so this is a video from their nature paper where it shows that the combination of external sensors, um, both inertial sensors as well as cameras can be used to adjust and dynamically adjust the stimulation state in real time. And this is of course replacing that tonic code that was historically the, the use case that was used in a uh, pain device. So once again, emphasizing that restoration of uh, neural codes, a more natural um, stimu stimulation paradigm being the goal. So this is a, that was a brief highlight of kind of where we've evolved in the state of the art um, on the right hand side, um, especially the science and the technology. But I want to briefly uh, show some examples of the left hand side and things that we should consider as we hear from the last two speakers. 
So first, a little bit on economics, especially for a UK audience, is when we come up with these new technologies, you know, what are the kind of economic constraints that we need to consider? And one of the key metrics is the incremental cost effective ratio, the ICER, if you will. And what this does, tries to capture, is the benefit normalized by the cost of our new intervention. So if we have a new bioelectronic um, innovation, uh, we say, how does it uh, show an improvement in terms of quality adjusted life years? And that would say B and B. So first uh, for qualities, you know, it's a measure on the y-axis of perfect health being a one, um, death being a zero. And then on the x-axis is uh, the time that you're actually benefiting from the intervention. In this case, out, they're assuming out till death. So we have our new intervention, we'll come in and panel B. And what we wanna do is then compare that with how would, the, uh, how would that consumer, how would that patient have done without our intervention? And then the difference of those areas gives us the net quality. And then what we do is normalize by the cost. And so you can think about this as an economic hurdle of about 25,000 pounds. There's a bit of a window between 20, 30,000 pounds per quality that's acceptable. And so if we come up with a new intervention that say is technology, it's a technological marvel, you know, absolutely uh, amazing, makes the cover of popular science, but we don't meet this ICER ratio, it will struggle to actually be adopted clinically. And that's something we need to keep in terms of our mindset for how we're going about the bioelectronic innovation space. The other thing that's critical is to think about workflow viability. And so as technology shrinks, what can we do to minimize the invasiveness of our procedures? And so this is an example of an innovation being pursued by a uh, spin out from the University of Melbourne uh, named Synchron. And if we go back to those examples of brain computer interfaces and the like, where historically people put in electrodes to an invasive procedure, Synchron's exploring how they might be able to um, use stent placement technology as another alternative to access in the central nervous system and get, uh, you know, be able to read out signals from the brain chronically, but without requiring, say, drilling a hole in the cranium. So this is their uh, video kind of illustrating the concept where on top of the stent, there are small electrodes that are placed and then wires are routed back through the venous system and to a device that's placed in the chest, which we'll show here. So on the or, you know, order of 10 plus electrodes are then available um, placed over the brain that can measure the field potentials that arise from brain activity. Those electrical signals are routed down to the device in the chest and then those can be telemetered out to external actuators to say um, control a computer or you know, select a certain cursor click on a, uh, on a template device. So this is something I want to reinforce as well as we listen to the next two speakers is thinking about ways to optimize our workflow and make it as viable as possible. You know, creating greater efficiencies for clinicians as they look to place these devices. And also, of course, that impacts the acceptability of the technology from the perspective of the patient. The last point is starting to think about um, inspirations from platforms, platform economics, ways that we can actually reduce frictions for innovation in the space. And I, I personally think um, taking some lessons from platforms could be helpful here. So first, when we say platforms, what do we mean? It uh, has multiple meanings to people. Uh, these are examples of three types of platforms, you know, from the, you're probably familiar with the product family platform, say the Volkswagen Audis, where there's a common design that can be repurposed across multiple um, products. And this has actually been a key element of innovation in the medical device space in bioelectronics, where a common device platform, such as that spinal cord stimulator we talked about um, for treating SCI investigationally, that's also been used, of course, for the treatment of chronic pain. So that's an example of a common product uh, platform that can be applied potentially to multiple disorders. Other platforms are as market intermediaries and also, of course, the ecosystem. And where I think these become important is looking at new ways to do discovery innovation, looking at clinical neuroscience and 
bootstrapping that off of uh, standard patient care in an ethical way so that we can build a positive feedback loop of treatment for patients, but also the discovery that's required for future devices. So this is a little schematic of what I used to, to illustrate this concept, um, where we as um, neural engineers can construct devices that are therapy and research platforms, and it provides a basic level of care guaranteed for the patient so they will benefit from receiving such a device However, on top of that, we can also include a scientific instrumentation platform, and this enables the discovery science to occur. So in terms of a virtuous feedback loop, you can think about a patient coming in, they need the latest therapy. They can then access that therapy using the baseline capabilities of the platform. But yet also, once ethics approval is there and a protocol is in place, they can also be enrolled in studies and then clinical neuroscientists can team with engineers to study how the signals are changing in the nervous system, how we might adapt the um, device to optimize care or explore new, explore new options for the treatment of novel diseases. Any innovations that we find, we can then update and put that into the next generation device. And you know, everything uh, going in the right direction build up a continuous feedback loop and drive innovation and really create an efficient way to bring innovations to market. And the reason I show this, um, especially in the center, is that electronics and the fact that we can write software, do upgrades, really gives us a unique capability. And it's something we want to keep in mind as we hear from the next two speakers of how we can take advantage of the unique capabilities of electronics to reduce those frictions for bring, of bringing uh, innovations to the market. The final point I want to make um, for take a few questions is, of course, all this space, we need to be very aware of neuroethics, informed consent, and the like. And so the, there have been um, studies at the Royal Society on the high human that have been put out, and you have access to those, um, those reports, as well as the Brain Initiative with the NIH has put out a neuroethics roadmap. And so one thing I really want to reinforce throughout this panel and all exploration of bioelectronic medicine is being aware of neuroethics and its role in terms of this innovation process. So to wrap up, um, you have the next two speakers are gonna give an exciting overview of applications as well as technology, both the, the future and present of these devices. And you know, Arun with the perspective of clinical applications and then Tim, talking more about the actual design and optimization of the stack. My role is to reinforce how those two elements feed into a broader definition of a successful uh, bioelectronic system. And I'd like for my talk for you to walk away with this holistic picture and keep this in mind when you're evaluating new technologies. And then finally, just to reinforce that this is a very important problem for us to solve. Um, it's very much worthy of our time and efforts and innovations to try to address this very large burden that society um, has on it. And what can we do taking advantage of the capabilities of electronics to try to try to make a difference in the treatment of patients. So with that, happy to take a few questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tim. That was fascinating. Um, so we've got a comment here from Ian Strickland. Um, from a UK perspective, NICE do not consider quality or ISA measurements when undertaking a medical technology guidance assessment. From an economic standpoint, they look at cost savings compared to current standard of care. Yep. Furthermore, my experience suggests that payers are also less interested in quality and ISA calculations and more on absolute in-year savings. Do you have a comment on that? Yeah, so this is um, from economics and the costing. Yes, yeah, so that's a very important, uh, very, very, very important point. Um, the, I think the, the ICER element is important to keep as a matter because there is an evaluation process with that. But as Ian brings up, another, another hurdle that you face on the economic side is that you are, will also be compared against other alternatives that are out there today. So if there is another intervention that is providing a solution today with a certain economic benefit, you will also be held against that as well. So there's both an absolute standard as well as a relative standard. So thank you very much for that clarification, Ian. And we've got a question from Helena Moskova. 
Um, my question is around liability with bioelectronic technology, specifically around neurodegenerative conditions. If a device manages the subject's balance, ethically speaking, who assumes liability for the subject? So same question with bio. I'm curious what, how uh, can you say what you mean by balance? So it's the, I mean, an example of a neurodegenerative condition. I mean, this is actually a challenge right now, say with the brain stimulation devices um, for Parkinson's is that there is not a, um, as far as we can tell from the existing clinical evidence, a slowing of the progression of the disease state itself. And so, and I, so I'll take this question, Helen, and I'll just say one of our big goals is to look at ways to perhaps slow degeneration in the future through alternative mechanisms of interaction and the like. As of right now, it's more of a palliative treatment for these symptoms. Um, in areas such as um, epilepsy, um, that's one where people have are trying very hard to come up with an intervention that looks a lot like a cardiac pacemaker. So in order being very explicit, it's not a cure for the underlying disease state per se, but it can actually provide a, a functional restoration um, as best we can using the technology. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I think um, that's all of the questions for now. I'm sure there'll be plenty more questions when we get to the panel discussion later. Um, but just to set the scene for Aaron's talk, we've uh, got a few more questions for the audience. Um, so thank you very much indeed, Tim. Um, so Poonam, are you able to bring, bring that up? Brilliant. Yeah, so some of you have already answered this, but um, if you go back onto menti.com, what are the new opportunities for neuromodulation beyond deep brain, spinal cord, or cranial nerve stimulation? So if you want to just enter um, any ideas you have there. Um, and just whilst we're waiting for that, I'll introduce uh, Aaron from Galvani Bioelectronics. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Charlie. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yep, we can hear you. Finally, uh, things are all working fine and everybody can hear me. I had some dealing problems, everyone. Um, Interesting, very, very interesting responses. Hopefully you'll be covering a few of these in your, in your talk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is extremely timely as well, so. Oh, loads of suggestions, fantastic. Okay, brilliant. And so you, you can uh, keep entering uh, your answers here, but if we just move on now to the next question, please, Poonam. Okay, so do you have a strong understanding of how to dose a neuromodulation therapy? Yes, kind of, or no? Okay, that's, that's good to know. So I think a nice deep explanation of, of those would be very helpful, Aaron. All right. This, this helps me to kind of focus specifically on, on specific parts of the talk rather than the uh, just going with the flow. Yeah. That's great. Thank, thank you. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, everyone, for, for that. Um, Aaron, are you able to share your screen now? I will be able to share my screen. Um, you do have a backup anyway, Charlie, just in case there are issues on my side. Um, but is everybody able to see my screen? Yeah, we can see that. Okay, fantastic. Um, first of all, thanks, no, thanks just, to just, Charlie yeah. um, and and Tim D for giving me the opportunity. Um, I think I should almost be called as Tim E to kind of uh, ensure that we're all in alphabetical order in terms of presentation. So um, once again, thank you so much. I come to you from a perspective that there is more than just what we know of neuromodulation in the historic sense. And 
and therefore I actually come to you as as kind of a living evidence of of kind of what is possible uh, in the field and um, also to say that um, back in 2012 and 2013 um, we looked at what needed to be done and we said that we would choose an entirely different strategic path um, and one where I had a very fortunate opportunity to be the architect of that vision um, in a way and ultimately implement and, and innovate on that vision as well. Um, the vision was that we could unlock multiple opportunities to treat chronic disorders by identifying the right um, within quotes, nodal intervention points. And this is extremely important because neuromodulation as a field has always been, um, I would say, biased for the right reasons based on the history and, and everything that they've, they've had to solve um, and has evolved from the cardiac pacemakers uh, to the stage where we are today. And those are excellent, excellent, excellent innovations that help patients. But I think looking forward, looking forward to what the next 20, 30 years is going to be and where we can actually innovate has been an incredibly rewarding opportunity. And what I would present to you today is just my personal experience in the, in, in, in the last um, eight to nine years or so uh, since we started the effort within GlaxoSmithKline and eventually kind of forming Gilvani Bioelectronics with, with Google Life Sciences, um, also called as Verily Now. So, that is what we did. So we started off with a vision to say for multiple chronic disorders, which has been the mainstay of today's uh, treatments that are out there uh, in the healthcare practice, can we actually imagine a day where electrical impulses will be the mainstay of treatment? Um, and I'm here, as I said, to show you the opportunity exists outside the brain and spinal cord as well. So what exactly is Neuromodulation. I like simple analogies um, and simple things to aid my understanding. Um, and whether you believe in creation or evolution, um, the vertebrate body has two exquisite axes of control. One is the molecular axis, which has historically been tapped into by pharmaceuticals and existing healthcare practices today, which has given rise, is given rise to small molecules vaccines and antibody mediated drugs, etc. And then there is the electrical axis. The electrical axis is basically the wiring diagram for the body. And the way I think of it is that the wires are simply, especially for folks who don't necessarily work in the area or even for folks who actually work in the brain and spinal cord regions, but not nothing outside of that. I kind of think of the entire autonomic nervous system, which kind of resides outside the brain and spinal cord as the wires that supplies the lights and the switches inside your home. There is a main, but all of the, there needs to be proper connections. And if you need to switch on the light in your dining room, you cannot expect just because you've turned on, turned on the mains in, uh, in, in the electrical supply, the dining room light won't turn on. And at the same time, if you want to build any fancy kind of changing tone, tonality of the bulbs or smart lights, et cetera, you actually really need to understand how well is the wiring uh, to that switchboard is and ultimately then uh, understand what needs to be done to that. So that's my analogy of why um, we started off in exploring the periphery because there is more, than, or more opportunity than one can choose at this point of time uh, to innovate. And the beauty of this approach, um, I think I would argue in contrast to the, to the brain and the spinal cord stimulation is that the nerves themselves, it's, you have to approach it as a tree. Uh, a, 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 um, and therefore, once you go up or go down the neural hierarchy, you can choose the right intervention point to balance out the risks versus benefit to the patient and ultimately because of where one is intervening to produce an effect, you can build in precision and you can also build in personalization, uh, all to go with things that, 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 that Tim Dennison spoke of. Um, and as a result, I think the approach to engineering would, be, would look slightly different um, to the approach to what has been traditionally been viewed uh, in, in, the, in the brain and spinal cord and, and cranial nerve stimulation systems. So I'll give you a few examples of that. 
Um, and as a result of that, I think when we kind of came out and put the vision out back in 2013 that this is how we would want to do it and there is opportunity in the periphery, um, we realized that this is not something that um, can be done just by ourselves. And it is probably stupid to imagine that uh, we have probably less than one millionth of the total brain power in, in, within the company and hope that we can achieve the best innovation out there. So we partnered. Uh, it was all going back to, to Tim Dennison's point of view. We, we could only achieve this because of partnering. Uh, we took a very biology-centered approach to innovation uh, because it was all about identifying the right target uh, and not necessarily going after And We told ourselves that we would not be creating another Me Too device uh, or, or an intervention on an already existing um, nerve target, et cetera. So therefore, it was all about unlocking the opportunity here. And as a result of that, I think what we realized was that, uh, for, at least for me personally, who had a background in clinical ph physiology and also had uh, a lot of biophysics training, identifying the nodal intervention points leads to a better understanding and will lead to a better, far better treatment than the existing ones, including in certain cases, pharmacological therapies, or in certain cases where there has been no opportunity for pharmacological therapies because of the type of, of disorders that one actually has um, or one actually finds in the system. So therefore, I think we, we partnered uh, in 2016 with Verily once we've built up our, our kind of discovery portfolio. And we found that the biology-focused innovation, as a result of everything that we had done until that point um, for the first three, three and a half years, would lead to a differentiated benefit. And we had ample evidence to show that it would lead to a therapeutic um, effect and therapeutic specificity in terms of improving patient benefit, um, at least from the data that we had generated. Um, and as a result of, of understanding all of this, we would be able to build a device that would lead to a broader access. And once we do all of these, then I think personalized medicine and optimized outcomes comes as a result of that. And I think Tim Dennison gave a great example of how this can be personalized, et cetera, and it actually took some time. But I think the key is about understanding where we need to start, and, and, and that's what my specialty is. So I'll actually move to the next most important concept here, because I think the way I, I mean, first of all, is that Galvani Bioelectronics originated within a pharmaceutical company, but there are key learnings that one we can, that people that we can learn from the traditional pharmacology um, that we can apply to neuromodulation, I believe, to understand the concept of dose. And this is extremely important because whenever I've spoken with people externally, they view medical devices as something that can be, that is a battery pack and therefore it's very different to what pharmaceutical um, pharmaceuticals are or biopharmaceuticals are. So therefore it's almost like a bit of a mental hurdle that people actually encounter when you talk about medical devices if they don't really understand. But the concepts are really, really similar to what the existing pharmacological concepts are. Um, I think I would like to kind of go through this um, with, with all of you. The traditional pharmacology always, as most of you would know uh, from your science courses, chemistry courses, or early pharmacology, if you've had a chance to do them, is that it always looks at dose of a drug or a concentration of a drug and measures response from a minimum response to a maximum response. And depending on what the drug is actually doing or the chemical moiety is doing to the body, you can either activate a system, meaning you can stimulate the system and you call that an agonist, or you can knock down the effects of something, um, which will be called as an antagonist or a blocker, or in simple terms like in neuromodulation, you call it a block, right? So that's the terminology kind of grounding for, first, for, uh, for, for everybody. Then I think if you look at disease processes, Pharmacology is thought is that every disease can actually be looked at either activation or a reduction in whatever happens to drive the pathology. So therefore, the strategy of either activating a nerve or inhibiting a nerve, the inhibiting the neural signals in the nerve, works very well, both in pharmacology as well as in neuromodulation. And once we know what to do with a specific disease, disease indication, then 
in pharmacology, we historically think about what is a concept called as receptor occupancy. The reason why I bring this up is extremely important because a lot of people, I did see one of the responses about stimulation of individual neurons. My next question there would be, why do we need to stimulate individual neurons? Do we actually understand the need to stimulate individual neurons? I think that might be true in certain cases like the brain and spinal cord. Is it really true in the periphery? Um, so that's why it's important to understand or borrow concepts from traditional pharmacology where you think about receptor occupancy. And if you think about an oral drug that kind of is taken um, kind of through the mouth, it kind of dissolves in, in the bloodstream and then gets carried to a state, uh, to a place where it binds to a receptor or an enzyme, et cetera. This can actually be measured um, in systems under a normal um, kind of um, in an in vitro system this is what it would look like. As you increase the concentration, the receptor occupancy increases. This is a very linear process. If you did not have any external kind of uh, aspects or complexities, we do know that biological systems are never linear or rarely linear. It's always curvilinear. And as a result of that, the receptor occupancy curves looks like this. The reason why I bring this up is because of this very, very important concept that I want to drive uh, in today's talk. It's that that it is a very steep curve that by the time you reach almost close to 80, 90 percent of receptor occupancy, you, you have the dose of the drug in case of an agonist. If you just look at the correlation between the blue dotted curve and the green curve, you're already at super ag agonism. Um, whereas in the case of, of the um, antagonist, by the time you re reach peak occupancy, you are almost inhibiting the effect. So therefore, from a point of view of a blocker, you need to occupy the receptors by a big proportion. Whereas in the case of an activation curve, one needs to ask really a question, do you actually hit the system really, really hard? Like for example, in the case, because neuromodulation has evolved from deep brain and spinal cord and neuroprosthetics, if everything in the body, like what a pancreas does, or what a liver does, or what a lung does, or what a heart does, is it a function of hitting it really, really hard and expecting that we, have, we know that we have activated the nerve? And I don't think that is the right way to approach it. And I will show you an example right in the next slide. Um, this is an example of nested loops. I think the engineers uh, will probably appreciate this a lot more than the biologists. But I think this figure is great because it kind of shows between an organ, which is in this case a depiction of the heart, to what is actually located outside the organ in terms of connections that ultimately go to the spinal cord and the brainstem, and then within the structures within the brain that ultimately regulate everything that is coming to the organ and everything that is being sent back by the brain. So therefore, when one is thinking about dose, it is extremely important, and also looking at target discovery, one needs to think about how are we altering the homeostasis in the body? And therefore, how can we ultimately define what the right dose for that system is? Um, and this is a classic example in the clinic. This is clinical, clinical data um, from three different vagal nerve stimulation trials for heart failure. What is shown here is various parameters in terms of intensity, frequency and pulse width at a specific pulse width of around 250 microseconds. And you're looking literally at a color profile of heart, of heart rate changes, where blue is basically you produce a significant heart rate decrease, and the red is basically one where you produce a heart rate increase. The reason why I love this figure here is that the same nerve, which is the vagus nerve, depending on how one activates it or what the parameters are, you could really produce a depression in heart rate or a decrease in heart rate, or you could actually trigger the, the increase in heart rate. And it is extremely important to understand this because that is the contribution of what happens. So there's a concept of push-push uh, pushback. So the experimenter or the clinician will try to give an impulse assuming that that is the right thing to do for the patient. 
it has an effect immediately as, as the nerve uh, is being stimulated, but then over time, the nervous system actually adapts, and then there is a pushback from the nervous system. So that's one of the reasons why therapies will actually lose their effect, especially in the case of medical devices and neuromodulation. So it's very, very important to understand what that, that, that homeostatic point really is in terms of resetting point. Um, and here is an example of Boston Scientific, which is a nectar heart failure trials. They park their patients in the tachycardic zone, whereas the cardiofed system parked their patients slightly in the bradycardic zone, uh, as you will see it uh, from the figure. And in both cases, these two trials failed. The only trial that was that is still running at this point of time is the anthem heart failure, which is from Cybronics. And luckily, they were working with a very good investigator, preclinical investigator, who helped them in understanding what this actually looks like. And there, he parked the patients where there was no net change. So if you look at the color graph here, this is around the stage where he almost sees negligible changes in heart rate. So that enables the system to kind of reset. So it, it is all about understanding how the nested loops ultimately balance each other and then ultimately keeping the patient at that right dose. Uh, and this is not about dose at one time because uh, it is about maintaining that dose over many, many years so the patient will ultimately have an implant and, and having a continued efficacy. So with that, um, I will probably uh, quickly go through a, a few examples here to show that both inhibitory effects as well as stimulatory effects or opportunities in the peripheral nervous system. The first one was a work that we carried out in collaboration with, with Sylvia Condi in, in, in Lisbon. Um, this is a diabetic rat that was fed on high fat, high sucrose diet. Um, we implanted the, um, the cuff electrodes uh, from Cortec, uh, which is one of the few companies that actually makes um, kind of electrode sizes from 100 microns all the way up to kind of one millimeter in terms of internal diameter of the cuffs. This was placed on one of the nerves that goes from the, from the carotid bifurcation, called as a carotid sinus nerve. And what you see here is basically the insulin tolerance test. These animals are their insulin tolerance, meaning that even though the body is sick, pancreas is secreting the insulin, the body, the cells are not being sensitive um, to the insulin that's being secreted. So therefore, the insulin tolerance is very low, similar to what you might find in type 2 diabetics. But what we find here is that upon nerve blocking, um, in this case, we were hitting the nerve pretty hard to almost have the total occupancy of the receptor because it's a blocking therapy, we found that after prolonged blocking, the insulin tolerance actually reverted back to what it was pre-diet levels, uh, kind of promising from a preclinical perspective. Um, and then we stopped the, uh, this, the neural blocking and the effect actually came back, so meaning that the animals became insulin um, intolerant back again. So that's one example. The second one is in a completely different therapy area, looking at polycystic ovarian syndrome, where we actually had animals that were made to be made to have polycystic ovarian syndrome by administration of estradiol. And these animals, again, had a nerve cuff electrode that was implanted on the nerve specifically to the ovary. And they were, uh, they were provided with kilohertz frequency AC block. Tim will talk a bit more about that. In the next in the next uh, talk here, and what we found was that the normal looking corpus luteum or the normal looking ovarian cells was significantly increased after prolonged neuromodulation in these animals, um, and also the in the classic symptom of patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome is that they have absence of of menstrual cycling in the in the rats it's called as estrogen cycling. And that actually comes back uh, with the initiation of neural block, uh, which starts at time zero. And then if it's continued for prolonged periods, you can see that the animals kind of start to uh, go through the normal cycling pattern once every three to four days. Um, consistent with that, um, the summary data is actually shown here that in the blocked animals, the neural blocking, because it's an activation of the sympathetic traffic that drives the pathology, so we are able to inhibit, almost put a boost noise, noise cancelling headphones over the nerve to filter out the noise, and that actually enables the animals to actually have um, cycling. Um, the next example is from the cardiac area, where in infarcted pigs, um, 
the classic things that the ICDs do is that it acts in a reactive manner and it is a bandage for an insurance policy for things to, to prevent the patient from dying, but it does not address the underlying cause. What we actually found was that bioelectronic block, again, this is using a different form of blocking technology called this DC block, uh, which again, Tim might actually cover parts of this. It's a different modality, it has its technical challenges, but nevertheless, what we found was that the number of animals where we could induce an arrhythmia, and if this was not terminated with the shock, these animals would continue to die um, on table. And we were able to prevent that uh, with, with the bioelectronic um, therapy here, the blocking therapy here um, on table. And also we were able to prolong the, the activation curve uh, for this patient, suggesting that we're able to increase this period during which the heart muscle cannot be re-excited, uh, which is pretty substantial effect in terms of pathophys altering pathophysiology. Uh, even in an acute setting. Um, that is, those are the examples of, of blocking the neural signals. Um, and I hope I've given you at least three different examples of showing that there's opportunity beyond the brain and spinal cord. And in the last kind of uh, three minutes here, I want to kind of give you two more examples here of uh, a completely different one. This is work that we did with, with Philippe Blancou, um, really uncovering a totally different uh, nerve target in the murine studies and uh, in, in, in contrast to the traditional vagal nerve stimulation that was employed uh, for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And what we found was that stimulation of this nerve leads to a reduction in, in the inflammatory cytokine levels or almost on par with the vagal nerve stimulation. But given that this would not have the impact of, of what the cervical vagus nerve stimulation might actually have, um, and we kind of targeted the apical splenic nerve here. And what we show here is that there was a significant decrease in, in the clinical scores uh, in the stimulated group compared to the non-stimulated or the sham group here. The second example um, of stimulation comes from our most recently published Nature Biotechnology paper, which actually targets the pancreatic nerve electro electrostimulation but we're not changing glucose level. The beauty of this approach is that we are targeting immune function that ultimately leads to sequestration of the immune cells in the lymph nodes that are close to the head of the pancreas. And as a result, we are able to prevent these animals from getting glycemic uh, because this is a not mice model, which is historically a validated model for type 1 diabetes. We're able to show that in, compared to the sham group, which is in blue, the electrical stimulated group actually has almost no development of, of type 1 diabetes. And we tested the validation of this because we knew that if it is nerve stimulation, a blocker of this uh, should ultimately uh, bring back the effect. And lo and behold, when we use the beta blocker, which is ultimately the neurotransmitter that ultimately and the adrenergic receptor blocker that mediates the effect, we found that um, the, these animals tended to develop type 1 diabetes again, suggesting and validating our, our neurostimulation approach. This was all done in a, in a prophylactic manner, but that is not the same situation that we might actually find in the clinic. Uh, in most patients, when we encounter them, we will, um, they will already have the disease. Um, so therefore, we tried an early variation of intermittent stimulation. And what you do see here is that in response, the, the dotted lines here, uh, the lines of the, the rasters at the bottom are just periods where the stimulation comes on and what happens to glycemia in the next couple of days. And what you do see here is that compared to the sham group, which actually had a big increase, we were able to slow down the progression of, of, of glycemic increases with an intermittent stimulation. Uh, so that is another example of, of, of stimulatory approaches. There has also been, while we've been working on this, there has also approaches within stroke where there has been evidence of implanted, um, uh, uh, this is the auricular vagal stimulation in the stroke rehabilitation group where it was a very nice, beautiful uh, randomized study where patients were either randomized to active stimulation or the sham controls. And then the control group ultimately was uh, randomized again, or the, the control group which did not receive stimulation received stimulation, and you can see the nice 
um, wonderful improvements in the clinical scores that were seen in this in this very limited but definitely um, a, a, an excellent proof of principle uh, clinical proof of concept that was seen with vagal nerve stimulation. I think most of you might have already heard about the impact of vagal nerve stimulation in rheumatoid arthritis. There were two different cohorts here. One was patients that were already on biologics. The other group was actually cohort two was the patient group that did were completely refractory to all forms of treatment, including biologics. And what we saw was that when the patient was actually stimulated with vagal nerve stimulation, there was a nice decrease in the clinical scores. When the treatment was stopped, the, sco the, the, it, the clinical scores worsened. And then when the, stimulate, the stimulation was started back again, the clinical scores came down, suggesting that neuromodulation can be used as a very dynamic effect. And therefore, going back to the question that was raised, that if you're thinking about a cost of a biologic compared to a cost of neuromodulatory device and what it takes, I think there is a definite cost equation um, that can be built in if the treatment is really efficacious. And the last slide here is that even in the classic area where um, sacral nerve stimulation has been used, um, we have at least shown many others, and uh, including ourselves, and this is clinical validation that a much more peripheral nerve target has a higher responder rate and also a higher efficacy. And we have actually pushed that forward into other um, exploring the other peripheral nerve targets as well and have published on that with Professor Warren Grill at Duke University. Um, Tim has already covered that. I think I just put this in as a different variation to what has been shown for targeting peripheral nerves. CBRX is a baroreceptor stimulation device. What you might see here is a patch electrode to stimulate the plexus around the carotid artery. Um, Tim uh, Dennison already covered the Synchron device. This is a StimWave device, which is, again, um, a, a device that can be activated using a wearable. Um, and the last one is the most recent kind of development from a company called Enusfera that, that has circuitry, again, that can be powered using a wearable. So all of these are extremely excellent innovations that will drive uptake or more applications into the peripheral nervous system. So there's quite a lot to do in terms of uh, what we can, um, what, what needs to be done to interface with a specific nerve in the periphery beyond just the vagus and deep brain and spinal cord uh, um, nerves, and also in terms of understanding how to power and, and ensure that we can um, we have the right type of technology to be able to neuromodulate. So I just want to finish this one slide. I think the classic challenges for translation from a developmental perspective is comparative anatomy. And the next step is really to understand for the concept of dose is really to understand target engagement. Um, what are the biomarkers that we are measuring in response to stimulation and how, will, how can that be used uh, to clinically de-risk early in development? Uh, so that uh, physicians, patients, and investors um, have great confidence in taking the therapy further for, for future investments. As Tim said, um, there is also an impact of referral pathway. We can take that separately. And the last one, I strongly believe, is going to be the next frontier. And I think if there are any young uh, trainees out there, I think just like the way Pharm pharmaceuticals drove a whole new area of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics all the way from both preclinical and clinical. I think there is an emergence of electrokinetics and electrodynamics, EKED, similar to PKPD in pharmaceuticals. So with that, I will stop and um, I'll hand it over to Tim Dennison or Charlie. Thanks, Aaron. That, that was brilliant. Um, we've just got time for one quick question, um, which is around wireless systems. Um, so can wireless systems only be used to trigger implantable devices, or could they also be used to, to transfer power? I think they can be used. I think the Nuspera system is an example of that, that the, that the device itself um, can actually be powered externally because the Nuspera system does not have an intrinsic battery or it just uses a very clever circuitry to be powered from outside. So I believe that can be done, but I will let the engineers speak here uh, in Tim Dennison and Tim, Tim C on that. Brilliant, and so on, on that, I'll hand, hand over to, to Tim C. Thank you. 
Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, let me just share my screen. Yep, brilliant. Okay, so um, thanks for to Tim Dennison and Arun for setting me up. So um, I'm going to move on um, really talking about the nuts and bolts of the technology. So um, what advances are happening in labs today and what can we see um, coming through uh, the pipeline in the next five to 10 years? So I really want to start off with um, kind of reviewing what's out there today from in, in clinics. So um, what we can see here are cochlear implants, which is one example, getting back to the question that was on, on asked of devices that are powered externally and also where data is transmitted from outside to in. Um, we've got deep brain stimulation devices such um, in the central nervous system that uh, Tim Dennison has spoken about. We've also got responsive therapies for things like um, epilepsy, but more recently we are seeing these technologies both shrinking in terms of size, but also moving in terms of target. And, and now we're looking at therapies that are targeting um, the, the autonomic nervous system. And so in terms of electrodes, what is um, approved for human use? On the very left, we have the very invasive. So we have uh, Utah electrode array provided by BlackRock for uh, intracortical recording. We have um, Medtronic uh, deep brain stimulation electrodes. Uh, there, are, there are many companies that make similar electrodes and these are targeting midbrain structures. And then we get to the less invasive um, electrode types such as um, uh, ECOG grid electrodes or strip electrodes that sit on the surface of the brain. And in the periphery, we have things such as um, cuff electrodes, uh, which are currently one, one of very few, I think, um, uh, of uh, approved electrode types for the peripheral nervous system. So um, setting up the grand challenges, I really want to start from uh, the regulatory um, standpoint. So number one uh, requirement is efficacy. The, uh, the product has to do what it says on the package. Um, and from a technical standpoint, the, one of the challenges is selectivity. So if we go back to this wiring diagram that Arun um, um, introduced, this is the wiring diagram of the autonomic nervous system. We can see um, this nerve here coming down on the right. Uh, this is the vagus nerve that goes to all our major organs. And so um, if we are to uh, connect to this nerve uh, at, at any point, um, uh, and we look at a cross section of the nerve, um, if we say connect to this using a cuff electrode by putting a cuff around it um, and we, we stimulate or we record or we block, um, we're going to be quite unselective as to, as to what um, we trigger. Um, and so as Arun mentioned, um, one of the key um, uh, decisions to be made is where do we put the electrode? If we go close to the organ, then we can get quite selective, but perhaps the surgery becomes more, um, more challenging or, or the nerve structures themselves um, are, are much more delicate. Um, then the second decision is if we penetrate the nerve and if we use a more invasive electrode, then comes the, the, the challenge of chronic stability. And, and this, um, this ties in with the second requirement, um, kind of hard requirement of safety. Um, and there is this trade-off between the level of invasiveness and uh, the level of selectivity. So, Ideally, we would like a completely non-invasive uh, approach, but they tend to be unselective. And the more invasive we get, um, the, the more selective they are, but then there is a problem um, with the chronic stability and the safety of the device. So from a, a technology standpoint, there are several aspects to the design of the device um, and, and how we deliver um, the therapy that I'm, I'm going to go through in the next few slides to talk about um, what is coming and what are the, what are the, the challenges that are being addressed um, in the community today? So starting off with the neural interface itself, uh, uh, interfacing with the peripheral or the autonomic nervous system. So if we look at electrodes, there are three categories of electrodes out there. So we have the cuff electrodes that wrap around 
the outside of the nerve. So we call these minimally invasive electrodes because they don't penetrate the nerve itself. We have the life and the time electrodes, which are the longitudinal electrodes that are threaded parallel to the direction of the nerve. And we have the time or transverse electrodes that, that, that are inserted perpendicular to the nerve. And we see many electrodes out there, but they all fall in one of these three um, categories. So what can we do um, that builds on um, kind of tried and tested electrotechnologies, but improves selectivity? So if we look here on the right, we can, we can develop new structures, say based on cuff electrodes. But um, one example here on the left is by flattening um, the nerve, we're still not penetrating it, but perhaps by putting in uh, micro channels and multiple electrodes, we can get more targeted uh, recording or stimulation. Uh, another approach is to have multiple rings or multiple segments on the, on the electrode itself, uh, and then use signal processing um, or, or beam steering to try and improve um, the selectivity problem. Um, another approach um, uh, that, that would all augment and, and complement the above um, is to uh, investigate new materials themselves. Um, here, on, here on the bottom left, we can see um, uh, new polymer and hydrogel based electrodes that um, aim to significantly improve um, the charge density uh, characteristics of the electrodes. I'm not talking about the, 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 the carrier substrate of, of, of the electrode, um, but the electrode itself. So no longer using metals that are tried and tested, such as platinum and iridium, but making the, 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 the conductors themselves out of, uh, out of polymers. This, this will mean that we can um, make the electrodes much smaller for the same um, charge delivery, or for the same area, we can deliver a lot more charge. And this is, um, this is critical for applications such as a neural block, as I'll go into. And then another thing we can do is we can functionalize electrodes. We can coat them with things like anti-inflammatory compounds to, to, to help the insertion and the healing process. And this can, this can perhaps uh, improve the viability of more penetrating electrode types. Okay, so if we look kind of beyond electrode technologies, is there anything else out there? So if we look at non-invasive methods, there's been a lot of work in kind of um, transcutaneous delivery. So there's been transcutaneous um, vagus nerve stimulation. Um, there's a lot of interest in fo uh, focused ultrasound um, or thermal stimulation. Um, the, the, the challenge, um, the, as I mentioned, the, the less invasive you get is selectivity. Um, but also um, there, are, there, there, there are some modalities such as um, fo focused ultrasound or, or thermal stimulation where safety might be a challenge. So these, these, are, these, are, these are key aspects that we need to address. Looking longer term, one, uh, one approach that has kind of um, recently um, had major impact in neuroscience is optogenetics. And there's recently been interest in, in applying this to the peripheral or autonomic nervous system. Um, the vision is that we can uh, develop a gene therapy that targets an individual fiber type or an individual fascicle. And then by bringing a, a, an optical, a light source close to the nerve and illuminating the whole nerve, only the, the, the fibers of interest uh, are, are activated uh, or inhibited. And so this kind of technology has been, has been demonstrated um, and tested uh, in animal models, but it's, it's, it's quite a far, uh, long way away from um, clinical uh, practice. So if, if we then um, take a step back, back to the, the electro technologies and we, we see how can we, uh, how can we improve the way that um, we interface with the electro technologies, one of the main things we do is uh, stimulate, such as in neuromodulation devices. So what can we do to, to improve the electronics? Um, so one thing we can do is improve the efficiency of the electronics. Currently, most stimulation done in devices is current controlled, where we have a fixed current for a set amount of time. The challenge here is because of the huge variability between uh, anatomy, but also um, surgery, we, we need quite a, a large dynamic range in our, in our stimulation. And this means that a large voltage uh, headroom uh, 
uh, results in, in a lot of wasted power. And so efficiency in current motor stimulation is generally quite low. And so in the past, voltage mode um, stimulation was very efficient way of providing stimulation. But the, the challenge here is being able to, to control the amount of charge delivered. And so there are new circuit techniques being developed, in, developed that are both improving current and voltage mode stimulation, making them both efficient but also safe. Um, another approach, if we look kind of uh, higher level into the architecture, is having multi-channel multi stimulation. So being able to, for example, focus or steer the, the stimulation target um, through novel electro designs, but also having the ability to be able to, to, to deliver charge balanced um, stimulation to multiple channels. Um, then we can look at the, the kind of the opposite of stimulation or instead of stimulating, uh, inhibiting. Um, and this is particularly um, relevant to the peripheral nervous system or the autonomic nervous system um, with techniques such as high frequency AC or a nodal block or DC block as Arun mentioned. Um, the challenges here that are currently being addressed really have to do with the power requirements of the, the, the block uh, methods, um, efficacy, making sure that we're, we're achieving complete block, for example, and obviously making sure that it's safe over, over a long period of time. So if we move from stimulation um, to, to recording, to observing activity, this has very much been motiv motivated by a lot of um, recent advances in the brain machine interfaces field, where electronic circuits have been developed to be both low noise, uh, low power, but also very scalable, been made very, very small. Here we can see on the right um, a, a, re a recent probe made by IMEC, uh, the Neuropixels probe, that achieves several hundred channels um, on, on, on the shank itself. And so how can we apply this um, to bioelectronic medicine? So one thing we can do is we can use this um, technology to, uh, recording technology, to observe compound action potentials um, or natural activity. Um, one opportunity is to actually reuse um, our stimulation electrodes, so being able to dynamically reconfigure electrodes to either be recording or stimulation. Um, and one of the challenges that, that exist is the ability to record during stimulation. So as you can imagine, um, when we stimulate, we, we, we flood the tissue with, with charge. And um, if we're recording from, from an adjacent electrode at the same time, we're going to pick up an artifact that's several orders of magnitude larger than the signal that we're trying to record. So ensuring that our recording hardware has the ability um, to, to continue recording during the stimulus is a challenge and is something that's being addressed in the community at the moment. And we will see this coming through. So if we, if we then have a, a, a look um, beyond um, kind of um, electrophysiology in, in terms of biopotential um, signals, um, there are methods being developed um, such as electrical impedance tomography um, that are looking at uh, functional imaging of nerves um, without actually penetrating the nerve. So by, by placing um, electrodes outside the nerve and measuring um, the impedance between different electrode pairs, um, we're able to, 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 to map functionally what's happening in, inside individual fascicles um, in real time. And so this might be a technology that miniaturizes and sees its way um, to de devices um, in the future. And so now that we have the ability to stimulate block and record, the next question is, can we apply feedback? Um, the, the vast majority of neuromodulation devices um, to date have been open loop therapies or open loop in a, in a local sense. Um, I guess it, in, in, in the larger, in the, in, the, in the bigger picture, they are closed loop therapies because the clinician or, or the healthcare system is in, is in the loop. So um, by, by, by visiting um, your clinician um, every, every week or every month, um, the, the, the dose that Arun uh, spoke about is, is fine-tuned um, and we have the, the, the feedback in, in that approach. But what we would like to do is, is to have um, that feedback applied on a time scale of milliseconds or seconds 
not weeks or months. And so this opens up a couple of opportunities as to how we can improve things. Um, from a low level, we don't actually know if we're stimulating or if we're blocking. Um, and so local feedback can give us kind of an indication as to how efficient the stimulation or the block is. And we can even alter the dose. So if, uh, if for example, um, we, we're stimulating, we see that, that, it's, um, that it's reliable, we can turn down the stimulus magnitude until the onset of stimulation. And then we can, um, and then we can both conserve uh, battery lifetime that way we can obviously reduce off-target effects uh, and we can improve the chronic um, reliability of electrodes. Um, from a high level, um, I, I guess um, a, a, a good example here is that of epilepsy. If we see the, the, the figure on the bottom right, um, we can be sensing um, biopotential activity such as local field potentials, looking for certain biomarkers um, such as seizures developing and then um, trigger stimulation that suppress those seizures. But as I mentioned here, having the ability to do artifact projection is critical. And so now that we're talking about processing, it, uh, it brings us to um, new signal processing methods. And so machine learning, deep learning, and AI technologies is something that, that, that's currently in the past five or 10 years re really kind of progressed. Um, and we've seen how these methods um, can be used to significantly improve performance. Um, this example here is in the central nervous system in uh, brain machine interfaces. We've shown that um, deep learning methods can outperform traditional signal processing methods um, in neural decoding. And so can we apply such uh, methods also to peripheral nervous systems? And so, Two things that we could do is, um, is use um, kind of um, AI methods for detecting um, biomarkers, such as in the, in the example of epilepsy, but also for improving selectivity. If we have multi-channel recordings, we, we can use such automated methods for, for, for um, achieving better selectivity. Um, there are obviously challenges, and one of the key challenges is consistency. So, um, a, an example where kind of machine learning or deep learning methods are very effective is in medical imaging. Um, there we have a very well-defined pixel array or a very well-defined uh, voxel array, such as in MRI imaging. Um, we don't have that in neural data sets. Yes, the electrodes are spaced apart from each other at a fixed distance, but because of variations in the surgery and the anatomy, really what we are observing is completely different. And so we, we, need, we, need, we need ways to be able to deal with this. And then when we, are, um, when we are producing more and more data, we need ways of actually compressing this if it's going to be processed externally, if it's going to be processed um, internally, uh, we need ways of doing very energy efficient processing. And, and another opportunity um, for AI methods is actually in analyzing data, experimental data. To, to actually, um, to actually um, uh, create uh, a signal processing pipeline that improves um, efficacy. And so this brings me on into computational methods that, so that as Arun mentioned, uh, he mentioned we have to experiment uh, frequently um, and we, we have to um, um, really kind of um, dig deep into the detail of the experimental protocol to demonstrate um, efficacy. Um, it would be nice if we had uh, computational tools out there that um, help us kind of um, uh, gather insight and optimize a the therapy before we actually um, get to experimental methods. And so the challenge here is uh, tools, even though tools do exist, they have been fragmented and specific to, specific to tasks. Um, a good analogy to where tools are very effective are in uh, chip design, in electronic design automation, where we can de de design chips of billions of transistors and have um, very high confidence that they will work. Um, obviously, biology is vastly more, more um, complicated to, to, to electronic chips, but this is kind of what we want to aspire to. 
And so what do we need to make this happen? We need the ability to simulate across different domains. We need to be able to simulate the, the tissue itself, but also the electric fields, the thermodynamics and other aspects. We need libraries of components, both biological and engineered. We need nerves, we need organs, we need complete organisms. And then we need structures for cuff electrodes or other different electrode types. We need ways of being able to enter and design the system and ways that we can um, optimize um, the way that it's used and visualize the results. On the right here are two platforms to, developed by ITIS Foundation in Zurich. So on the top right is sim for life which is um, a commercial platform that aims to integrate many of these components. And on the bottom right is an online platform that's been developed by the same foundation um, for the NIH um, Spark program. And so just to um, uh, finish off, so now that we've uh, spoken about the, the specifics of um, how we're going to interface with the autonomic or peripheral nervous system, I just want to look, about, uh, look a bit at the embodiment of the device itself. What we currently have are devices of the order of um, uh, centimeter scale, I would, I would call these. So matchbox sized devices that consume of the order of um, tens to hundreds of milliwatts. Um, these devices contain a battery. What we're seeing coming through now are devices that are kind of about a centimeter cubed volume. Um, and, and because the volume has reduced, so has um, the energy capacity. Um, since battery technology is the same, uh, most of these devices use um, uh, lithium ion or lithium polymer batteries. Um, then what we're going to see coming through are even smaller devices, devices of the order of a millimeter. Um, obviously, when we go from a cubic centimeter to a cubic millimeter, um, we're no longer able to include a power source. And, and so we need new ways of being able to deliver power wirelessly. So um, in current devices, uh, power is de delivered um, in order to, to, to perhaps recharge a device where, where there isn't a primary um, power source. Um, and then looking even further into the future, um, devices might get even smaller, kind of under the si size of a, a few hundred microns or tens of microns. And so this really brings in the notion of uh, neural dust, brain dust, neural grains. Um, where, where technologies will be distributed um, over larger um, neural regions. Um, there's an interesting roadmap um, here referenced from the right that, that tries to predict where things are going over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, even though some of these date predictions might be a bit ambitious in my view. Um, and so I mentioned that um, on this slide, I've mentioned how um, Going from the, the centimeter scale devices to the millimeter scale devices, we need ways of delivering power in real time. Um, and so there's been a lot of effort, particularly in the research community, in how we can do this using electromagnetic means. So for example, having near field coupling where we have a coil on the outside, a coil on the inside, um, and we're trying to couple, uh, uh, transmit power that way. And the, the challenge comes with the size of the coils and how far apart they're spaced. Generally, if the coils get very small and they're spaced uh, apart from each other quite far, then uh, the efficiency is very poor uh, and that doesn't work. And so um, a lot of what is needed for bioelectronic medicine are devices that will be implanted quite, um, quite deeply, not um, superficially. And so, some groups have been looking at ultrasonic powering of devices where um, the, the, the power transfer efficiency um, would be much better. Um, challenges to do with ultrasonic power transfer have to do with how do you couple the energy in, um, uh, inside the body? So do you need to, to have a gel to couple the energy in efficiently? Um, then uh, misalignment of transducers, uh, directionality of transducers, and obviously in the, in the central nervous system, there's the challenge of getting through the skull, um, but, but, but um, in the periphery, there might, be, um, there might be challenges there as well. 
Okay, so to wrap up quickly with some um, concluding re remarks on some of the technologies I've spoken about. Um, so from, from a regulatory perspective, safety and efficacy are the, are the two key hard constraints. Um, the, one of the main technical grand challenges, as I call them, is selectivity. But it's also important to remember that desirability is also a key driver, both from the clinical perspective, but from, from the end user perspective. Um, and so there is this risk versus reward trade-off. And obviously, um, we want to uh, develop technologies that are less invasive wherever possible. Um, so a, a lot has already been invested in validating devices, validating materials. And so there, there, there has been and there continues to be a, a reluctance to, to, to kind of um, apply new materials, new methods in kind of traditional therapies um, by, by established, um, established industry. And so this brings um, opportunities um, for, for, for new startups uh, and new players in the field uh, to innovate. And as uh, Tim Dennison has mentioned, research platforms here would be key enablers. So being able to develop devices that can be redeployed either through software upgrades or by changing electrodes and the targets um, that they're put in. Um, so that the investment made um, is kind of um, reusable um, and a lot, of, a lot of the regulatory process as, as well um, is streamlined to support that. Um, and then finally, I would like to finish off with um, actually the same slide that Tim Dennison um, finished off on, which is technology is just one aspect. I've been talking about lots of technical aspects of developing um, bioelectronic medicines. Uh, but there are lots of other pieces of the puzzle that also need to be um, uh, taken into account when developing therapies. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, just before we get on to the panel discussion, we've got one question here from Alex Casson um, saying you Focus on uh, in silico approaches. What's your view on phantoms? Um, well, it depends for what. So, um, in silico approaches um, is, um, I guess, for for active um, for for simulating um, activation and block and um, the. Um, the emulation of the neural interface itself, I, th I think the in silico approaches um, are, are, are very um, useful. I think where phantoms are useful are things like the wireless power transfer um, and also for a lot of the safety testing in terms of heating. Um, so I think both phantoms and um, in silico approaches have got their, their place, um, but I think they are complementary. Um, they're not kind of, um, one wouldn't uh, replace the other. And Tim, kind of yeah. building on, I think where Alex is driving at is, where do you see the role, in addition to the in silico uh, modeling, like you showed that's coming out of Spark, what mm -hmm. about um, in vitro, ex vivo, in vivo, like in your own work, how do you do that continuum of model validation um, to prove out your technology stack? Yeah, I, I guess that's that has to do with maturity of, of the technology. I think, um, for example, in 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 um, developing interfaces for the peripheral nervous system, um, I think ex vivo is a good way to, to 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 reach a point that you can you can you can get a good n number. So you can you can test on a statistically significant number of um, of of, of um, tissue samples before you, you get into the in vivo point. So, so acutely, I think ex vivo can give you a lot more confidence on your technology. Um, and then you only go to the in vivo when you need kind of more chronic validation. So again, I think ex vivo, in vivo um, approaches and in vitro um, complement each other on different time scales and on different levels of maturity of the technology itself that you're validating. Tim, can I actually kind of give an example of how to just complement what, what Tim C was saying there uh, from, from my experience? Is it okay? 
Yes, of course. Yeah, maybe maybe Charlie, what we do now is we'll start just trans transitioning over to the panel. You kind of we can pick up this theme and then knock off a few other questions. And then I we actually have um, Ian Strickland from Electricore, and I was going to ask we can unmute Ian, and I was going to ask him a question about COVID and bioelectronics, um, and something that kind of popped up in the recent literature. So go ahead, Aaron. You take it from here. Yeah, I, I think I think from my practical perspective, I think the as as Timsey said, it, it is very very complementary. I think each one of these aspects, um, at least in my experience in the peripheral autonomic nervous system, has value. Uh, in silico systems, I have incredible value in terms of understanding nerve propagation and potential properties and, and understanding what the thresholds, et cetera, for activation of a certain fiber type might actually be. Um, and then if you use that information to ultimately check with the ex vivo preparations, both, both animals as well as human cadaver uh, samples um, where, where possible, and um, then that gives you a correlation from an in silico to um, kind of ex vivo, and then we can move and refine parameters from that ex vivo preparations into kind of in vivo studies. And I think we've had pretty decent success with that approach where you're using one to de-risk the others, um, and th that works remarkably well, even from a biology perspective, in terms of understanding the dose. Yeah. Good. So I see people are using the Q and A, um, which I appreciate, and we'll we'll start looking at those. So Charlie and I will look through. Um, Poonam, I was wondering, is it possible to uh, unmute Ian Strickland? Okay, I see Ian's coming on board now. The reason I'm calling on Ian is that you know part of it is we are in COVID. Is that um, you know, Aaron made a reference to stimulation of the vagal nerve, specifically um, the splenic nerve in his case, but even up at uh, up in the neck around you know cranial nerve ten, there's interest in perhaps helping with cytokine scores, uh, the cytokine storm and the like. And there's been some very early pilot work, and I was just wondering, you know, Ian's in from industry, uh, if he can give a very quick overview, you know, a couple minutes on just some of the short-term opportunities, perhaps, um, relevant to COVID. Absolutely, and thank you very much for um, all the speakers. It's been great to listen to you guys today. Um, uh, what Electrocore have is a non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator called GammaCore. Um, we are actually in the UK market, we're NICE approved and reimbursed by the NHS, so we've made great progress. But life for Electrocore and vagus nerve stimulation started out with some early trials in um, asthma, looking at respiratory distress uh, and exacerbations of asthma. Um, there's been some great work out of Long Island by uh, a group hosted up by Kevin Tracy, looking at something called the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. And although we moved away from respiratory disorders um, and you know started our pipeline in headache, um, we, we've always kept a close eye on uh, what impact stimulating the vagus nerve sort of, you know, Tim was talking about selectivity, sort of non-selectively, if you like, it has a, you know, a, a number of downstream effects um, in terms of its efficacy. Um, with the, the, you know, the outbreak of COVID, we started to revisit the idea that stimulating the vagus nerve could potentially uh, impact the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway, which is in essence, driving away from a pro-inflammatory state to a more balanced state of the immune system, uh, reducing the cytokines uh, that are often pro-inflammatory, as has been seen, I would guess, in the uh, rheumatoid arthritis studies um, that have been done by Galvani. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some early pilot data um, looking at the fact that if you stimulate the vagus nerve, potentially for those patients that are experiencing a sepsis-like cytokine storm that has been described as being, you know, down the most severe end of COVID for the patients that have real respiratory failure, um, that there might be some utility for our therapy or vagus nerve stimulation therapies uh, in helping managing those patients that find themselves needing oxygen support or 
um, you know, intubation. Um, for us as a company, um, you know, we were so submitted an emergency use authorization to the FDA. Um, they are currently uh, uh, deciding whether or not they will grant that. So it's certainly off label uh, in the US, although we have a clinical trial ring in the US, a small pilot study, uh, but we hold a CE mark for um, respiratory distress. So we do have a, a trial running in uh, Valencia at the moment in Spain. And obviously those early pilot studies, we were really interested to see whether or not we can impact the progression and severity of um, the COVID decline for respiratory uh, distress uh, and see whether there is an implication for future benefits. Thank you. Yeah, so that's in uh, Walter um, joining us from over in the Netherlands uh, from Delft also points out that uh, University of Bonn is also running a trial. So just to reinforce that um, even in the light of the COVID epidemic that there's potentially a role for bioelectronics to be playing a part. And hopefully after seeing the three presentations, especially uh, with our own, you have a sense of the mechanisms at play. So one thing um, I was gonna, looking at the questions, Charlie, the, um, it's gonna very quickly, I'm looking for ones that are broadly of interest. So any sense, um, Tim C on energy requirements for electromagnetics um, when you're talking about that. And one thing I'll point out also brought up by Wouter is um, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation is also a way to non-invasively engage the nervous system, you know, taking advantage of uh, you know, Maxwell's equations and voltage induction with changing magnetic fields. And that also kind of has an early, um, it, it was a nascent technology really grown in the, in the UK. So, um, you know, a little bit on electromagnetics and um, power requirements there, Tim, but also understanding that's a, a therapy opportunity as well. Yeah, um, on, the, on the energy efficiency requirements, I think it really has to do with um, the amount of power that you want to deliver to the device um, and the safety implications. Um, so if, if your device only needs microwatts um, and is tiny, but you have many of them, um, it really depends on how much energy you're going to dissipate in the tissue. Um, I mean, ultimately, um, the, 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 the key requirement is not to increase the temperature of the uh, surrounding tissue. Um, and so, um, for example, in cochlear implants, the coils are quite large and they're quite placed quite closely together. Um, and um, uh, some of the coils even have um, ferrite cores. And so efficiencies in, in, in those cases are very high. Um, you can get the efficiencies well above kind of 60, 70%. Um, in the case of some of the devices I was mentioning that are kind of millimeter scale and they're spaced a centimeter apart, efficiencies are of the order of 1% or 0.1%, which means that 99% of the energy is being dissipated as heat. But if you're only delivering 10 microwatts, 99% of, of the, the energy is only another, is only a milliwatt, which wouldn't cause um, a heating of the tissue. If you're trying to deliver say 100 milliwatts um, and you only have 1% efficiency, then that's a problem. So building on that, th there are several thumbs up on the wireless power transfer. So now going the other way though, um, the getting data out. And so what do you see are the trends there in terms of getting larger amounts of information out of the, uh, out of a device? I mean, um, so I, I've mentioned coupled coils, um, but people are using radios to get information out. So far field, uh, far field uh, methods using antennas, um, generally um, mixed band radio and things like Bluetooth low energy, they can get up to a few megabits. Uh, there have been approaches looking at ultra wideband based approaches, um, pulse based approaches that don't, um, that, that, that don't require a, a clock or a carrier. Um, I haven't seen any kind of uh, clinical devices out there that use ultra wideband um, com communication. Um, also the, the challenge with ultra wideband communication is the receiver. So if you're to make a, a unidirectional um, wireless link, that's fine if the receiver's on the outside, but if you want to get data into the body, 
um, the receiver would consume a significant amount of power. Um, so these are kind of different approaches from, from kind of a, a wireless perspective. Great. So I, the, I, you know, Charlie, I'd say the next one is getting more of a clinical perspective from Prasad Maladi. Thank you, Prasad, for sharing. Uh, his experience has been mixed with neuromodulation in terms of pain and bladder control. And he mentions that, um, th that one of the issues potentially is that you can only stimulate right now with many devices and not uh, record the response of the nerve in, in, uh, in real time. And so, Arun, I'm going to pivot this over to you um, for your perspectives uh, the role of potentially sensing or how do you, where does sensing come in for dose adjustment? One thing I'll just share briefly is that, you know, one example other than NeuroPace device that Tim C was sharing was Saluda uh, Medical is actually looking at just this um, in terms of measuring the evoked potential off the spinal cord in real time and using that to close the loop. And so you can think about that as a way of confirming that you've engaged the nervous system in a uh, consistent way and you can build that. They've actually explored building a feedback loop on that. And that's a technique that actually evolved from cochlear implants where they would use the evoked potential response to understand whether um, the device was engaging the cochlea and, and say infants who have yet the ability to communicate whether the device is working or not. But you know, Arun, I think this is an interesting point on you know, when you get, yeah. you're emphasizing dosing what do you see as the role for different types of sensors in terms of both confirming you have the right dose and optimizing care? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think I think that's a very good comment, and I totally agree with Prasad there that the existing devices have only partial efficacy, and it only works in in in, in a part of the population that they are ultimately was implanted in. So there is absolutely no doubt about that, and I think there is a need for better therapies. I think one of the examples that I shared in my talk was that despite the presence of the Medtronic Intersim device, I think there has been approaches that has been looked at in the literature for many, many years, especially from a clinical perspective from Howard Goldman and Ken Peters looking at the compound pinendal nerve as a much more peripheral source of intervention. And um, I think the concept of pudendal nerve stimulation um, would be uh, a very promising approach um, and it is accessible using small percutaneous wires uh, that has been shown by clinicians or, or investigators there and actually has a higher responder rate. Coming back to the technology and the need, I think it is all about defining what the biomarker of approach is. I think the way the spinal cord stimulation is ultimately titrated is that one is looking at a visible motor threshold and then keeping the patient at sub-threshold to the motor activation. So they're looking for a leg twitch or a leg muscle twitch, and they're keeping it slightly lower than that and hoping that it would work. And that is how clinically it's done. Um, I, I think talking to urologists and having worked in this area, I think there are approaches where you could dynamically look at urodynamic studies or potentially um, kind of other markers if they were closed loop neural sensing uh, markers, which is a bit more difficult compared to just doing an acute urodynamic. So there's a case to be made for both an initial open loop followed by a closed loop where you can use results of the acute urodynamic studies at the point of implant and during follow-up, et cetera, to assess the feasibility and the benefits of that and then moving it on into kind of a closed loop therapy. Um, I think I think that's a very, very valid point, but the interfaces will look very different to what the traditional kind of spinal cord parallel electrodes, et cetera, would be, or the pedendal or other downstream nerve targets like dorsal genital nerves. Yeah. Good. One one question I have to, to all of you is, where, where do you feel the UK is um, compared to other countries in the development of bioelectronic medicines and what could really make the UK a, a world leader in, in this area? Should we go in reverse order? Tim C, Arun, and then I'll speak. Yeah, Tim C. Oh, Tim, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, I think I, I can start off with um, 
opportunities. Um, I think I think um, regulatory is is obviously um, one of the main causes of the value of debt, <laughs> um, and it's it's really important to build a bridge across this value of debt, um, both from from regulatory perspective, but also from funding perspective. So. Um, we, we have funding, say, um, to do the basic research. We have funding to spin out a company. Um, it's, it's at these transitions um, where um, kind of the regulatory process kills the, the, the project. So um, finding kind of uh, effective solutions at these, these crossroads um, is an opportunity. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, um, um, the regulatory framework um, and kind of um, developing, um, or I guess, Tim D, you can, you can go into that. That's your, your area. Um, I'll, I'll, pass, I'll pass over to Tim D for, for, for the regulatory um, aspect. Um, yeah, I'll pick up on that at the end. Arun, um, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I think I have a very um, bullish view on both the existing prospects as well as opportunities for UK, having been in this area and having worked from within the UK. Um, I think uh, there is there are extremely kind of strong um, opportunities that have kind of, or rather scientists who have worked in this area, especially I think given the historical view of neuroprosthetics being emerging from uh, UK, um, and, and I mean, the classic example is Paralympics, et cetera, right? But I think the more recently, I think the Graphene Consortium, I think the Wellcome Trust funded CANDO um, Consortium, which looks at optogenetics in, in, in brain, um, mood and psychotic disorders is another great example of where uh, even in the existing areas of deep brain stimulation, I think there are some interesting both optogenetic as well as new material approaches. I do know that there are uh, in addition to Tim C's work at Imperial, uh, I think there are a couple of other investigators that I think who do an excellent, excellent job. I mean, coming back to the whole AI machine learning, the Themis programmatics at Southampton has done an incredible job with his memory state technology development, et cetera, and he's looking to kind of move that into multiple industries. So I think there's a great opportunity there in terms of chips for for um, for neuro for neural neuromodulatory applications, and then there are better materials and higher resolution and more flexible materials coming out of the Crick Institute with 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 an excellent postdoc called Romeo Rax, who actually works at, at the Crick Institute. And I think there are interesting, even within the traditional areas of of deep brain and spinal cord, there is some interesting mix of of characters there who are kind of prodding and pushing along their own aspects. I think from the peripheral side of things, especially from where I sit in a company and hopefully as an entrepreneur, is that there would be a great deal needs to be done to enable early clinical de-risking studies, which are currently being done in, in Eastern Europe or, or in Poland for some of the early cardiovascular neuromodulation studies or in the US, et cetera, with their non-significant risk studies. I think that would be a great start. I wouldn't classify that necessarily as a regulatory hurdle, but more um, kind of awareness and, and more aptitude uh, from from clinicians and, and everybody involved within that to make that happen would be a great. And then the last one is really uh, to really push forward and maybe even offer neuromodulation because I think physiology per se, as a physiologist, I would say physiology is a lost art, but almost putting physiology along in the hands of engineers and not and enabling them to understand uh, systems and, and look at that from a more holistic view uh, to then tailor make solutions rather than having a hammer and then looking for a nail. I think it should be, an, it should be the other way around. Uh, I think UK is in a good position for that. Um, it has all the right elements, but I think these things would definitely help development within the UK um, rather than just discovery. That's my view. Yeah, I'll be brief because we're basically at time. The first thing I'll put the pitch, I got to turn off my background to talk about AIs being too clever um, and whiting it out. So there's a book from the Royal Society, a report out on iHuman, 
the reason I point this out, um, Charlie, is that it actually explicitly goes through the UK strengths. Um, and so instead of doing a laundry list um, from that, from that um, report, I just point everyone to that for a more comprehensive answer than we have time to get into now. In the short term, in terms of the technologies, the ecosystem, an element that I'm investing in, and I see we have Anne Van Hostenberg from um, kind of a King's UCL initiative uh, uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust, looking at quality management systems, first in human clean rooms, that can be a resource for the UK community. And I think this idea, as Tim C has emphasized, of building out an ecosystem structure that allows us to spread the costs out among ourselves um, because it's, it's quite a large hurdle in order for someone to say, create a quality management system for a specific device. But if, if we as a community can join together in some pre-competitive areas, um, that will actually help, I think, to drive innovation help some startups get up and off the ground. And then as Arun made a reference to another opportunity for us in I'd say our shifting regulatory environment um, with where the UK is vis-a-vis -vis the political dynamics with the EU and the like is to say, are there elements of the FDA early feasibility trial system uh, and the master file system that supports investigational device exemptions and the like can we pull some of those best practices over and maybe make those available to us through the MHRA um, and then get access to the trust? You know, obviously for ethical research, but what it does is help to streamline some of the processes, get rid of some of the redundancies and, you know, overall just reduce friction to getting those early answers on whether a neurotechnology is viable or not. Brilliant. Well, I'd just like to finish by saying thank you very much to um, all of our speakers today. We're just slightly over time, but we're, we're pretty much there. Um, so thank you. Thank you all very much for your um, fascinating presentations. Um, and a final reminder to everyone that we'll be having another uh, webinar next month on brain computer interfaces, which I hope you can uh, join us for. So uh, and Charlie, thank you very one, much. And one quick one is I just note this will be you know, we had questions um, that will be recorded and made available on the KTM website. And then also, Charlie, we had requests about uh, copies of the slides. And so I'll, I'll take that back. We can talk among us as the presenters and we'll come up with some level of slides perhaps to share and make that available along with the recording of the video. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, everyone.